Hello everyone, Crow here. We've been building a beginner-friendly guide to Overwatch gameplay theories in the past year, and today we'll be talking about rock, paper, scissors specifically for the tanks. For anyone new to Overwatch, let's preface the topic with a quick introduction since we're discussing one of the most complex roles in Overwatch 2. Out of the three roles you can play, tank is the most confusing and complex in terms of game sense and strategy. But with a reduction of the role down to one tank per team, the rock, paper, scissors concept began to surface as a critical component and mechanic for the role. Role. So even for existing players from Overwatch 1, the topic is still pretty difficult to digest. So we've honestly been pushing off this topic for a while now and I've also been traveling around all over the states, attending data and cloud related conferences, so that's just my excuse for not being able to upload in the past month. But I'm back now, so let's get started. The rock paper scissors for tanks is based on the more general rock paper scissors video we made previously, and at first glance it seems pretty straightforward. When the enemy tank plays here Hero A, playing Hero B makes it much easier to win. But when you play Hero B and the enemy plays Tank C, the game just gets way more difficult. So to counterpick that, you start playing Hero A. And wait, doesn't that sound familiar? And thus, the Rock Paper Scissors game was born. But rather than presenting you with my personal flavor and interpretation of Rock Paper Scissors for Tanks, we've compiled comments from numerous community discussions and discussed the topic with 20 pro players, top 500 one tricks, and coaches to give you the most well seasoned information available. First, let's look at the data we've collected from our community site that's currently under development. In the site, we took community votes to assess the current perception of which heroes are strong or weak against others in both 1v1 and overall gameplay. We obtained roughly 100,000 rows of data, and here's what that looks like when graphically plotted for the tanks. Let's take a look at Wrecking Ball as an example to show how to interpret this graph. The horizontal row is a percentage of people who rated Wrecking Ball to be stronger in the matchup. The community consensus was that Wrecking Ball is strong against Winston and Reinhardt, but in contrast can struggle to compete against Brawl and off-tank type heroes. The vertical column is a percentage of players who rated Wrecking Ball to be at a disadvantage in the matchup, but there's actually a third dimension to this graph. If we take a look at Wrecking Ball's matchup against Doomfist, we see 30 and 53%, which doesn't actually add up to 100. This is because 17% of the votes indicated that the matchup between the two heroes is fairly even. Though not common across all of the matchups, there are decent Decent number of cases where this kind of disparity shows up. When we take all three dimensions into account, we can evaluate that though the majority of the players find it difficult to play ball against Doomfist, Doomfist isn't necessarily a counter against Wrecking Ball. Then once you assess this graphic, are we done talking here? No, definitely not. This is primarily an evaluation of the community perception and ignores many factors such as the rank and level of understanding of the game as a whole, which makes it insufficient to call this the end all be all. Especially for the tanks released in Overwatch 2 like Junker Queen and Ramatra, the statistics seem to be a little bit unreliable. And we can't forget the fact that the current in-game balance and the hero composition of both enemy and ally teams can impact these tank matchups. The real takeaway from this graph is the patterns and trends apparent across multiple heroes. The first pattern is a similarity between Doomfist, Wrecking Ball, and Winston. These three heroes are generally assessed to be weak against most other tanks when compared side by side, because all three of these tanks are reliant on utilizing their mobility to create chaotic fights and have a playstyle of targeting a vulnerability of the enemy team, they generally aren't used to pick battles directly with the enemy tank. The dive tank archetype is clearly distinct in its characteristics, making it the first of the rock paper scissors group. The other groups for Poke, Anchor, and Rush don't have such distinct patterns for the tank matchups, but at least for Dive, it's easily distinguishable. The second pattern is the group of heroes with a high number of green values. Orisa, Zarya, Ramatra, and Diva fit this pattern, while Sigma also stands out by having basically no distinct counter. If I try to rationalize what these five tanks have in common, it essentially boils down to the fact that within the past six months, each hero has played a solid role in the past few matchups. In other words, these heroes generally have a positive matchup because they're strong heroes to begin with. So then, should we ignore these heroes and assume their stats are not meaningful, and it's just a byproduct of the balance patches? No, this means that we need to dissect these heroes as in-depth as possible because they've been a part of the core meta for an extended period of time throughout multiple patches. In Overwatch, the kit itself often makes heroes retain meta relevance, and it's likely that this will continue to be the case. For now, we can simply consider these heroes to be one of our best tanks to main. Mastering just a few of these tanks basically allow you to cover 99% of the rock-paper-scissors situations in your favor. And in contrast, the remaining tanks are sort of the 
niche case or off meta heroes. Heroes like Reinhardt, Junker Queen, and Rodog have been off meta picks in the last six months, making the evaluation of these heroes less accurate from the community. To summarize, Winston, Wrecking Ball, and Doomfist fall into the dive category as a distinct group in Rock, Paper, Scissors. Orisa, Zarya, Diva, Sigma, and Ramatra are meta agnostic tanks. Reinhardt, Junker Queen, and Rodog are outliers, which require a more in depth evaluation. Now, let's take a look at each of the 11 tanks and evaluate them based on the Rock, Paper, Scissors system, but also incorporate the pro and top 500 one trick players insights to evaluate each hero in the Rock, Paper, Scissors ecosystem. Let's start off with Winston, the bread and butter dive tank. Out of the three dive tanks highlighted from the community data, Winston has the lowest base stats for dueling. 1v1ing another tank beyond contesting them for space is, in most cases, going to be a terrible decision. However, despite being a dive hero, Winston has multiple options against other tanks. Being able to sustain yourself with bubble or even divide the enemy team up by dropping the bubble between the enemy front and back line, which is something none of the other dive tanks are capable of. Because Winston's default playstyle is dive, he shows a distinct advantage over tanks like Zarya, Sigma, and Reinhardt. Though these tanks have high damage output, due to their lack of mobility, you can leverage amazing value from your speed and vertical mobility. And wait, Winston beats Zarya even though she's a rush tank? Well, by the generic definition of rock, paper, scissors, rush should technically be dive, but this isn't necessarily necessarily the case for Winston, making it a key characteristic of the hero. In the case of Doomfist and Wrecking Ball who we'll cover in a bit, they fall into the standard rush beats dive dynamic, and this is what sets Winston apart from the other two heroes. The dive style Winston is especially weak against rush and anchor tanks with higher 1v1ing capabilities. This includes Roadhog, Maga, Junker Queen, Orisa, and Diva. However, in these matchups, the enemy and ally compositions play an important role in determining the outcome of the fights. For example, Winston's high synergy support, Ana is also one of the best counter picks against these enemy heroes, so there's plenty of room for your allies to cover your weaknesses in the tank battle. There were a lot of questions raised about Winston's rush capabilities in our previous video, but they've already been proven in the past by utilization in GOATS as well as a full dive composition, meaning your entire team is structured around jumping in as a single unit without leaving a diveable backline, which is the entire point and characteristic of of rush. In this way, a rush style Winston can take advantage of the more exposed backline against other dive tanks like Doomfist and Wrecking Ball. Meanwhile, the anchor and poke playstyle is more or less unusable and is reflected in the entire seven years of the IP's history. Next is Doomfist. He's the most extreme case of dive and excels in assassinations. Rush, anchor, poke, and the other three playstyles aren't available for this hero and specializes in melting the enemy backline. Amongst the dive tanks, Doomfist has the highest raw specs, having the lowest time to kill kill on squishies compared to Winston and Ball. As such, Doomfist is unable to assassinate tanks with his bursts, making him especially vulnerable to stronger rush and anchor tanks with higher 1v1ing capabilities. Tanks like Garisa and Hog have the CC to cut off your power block, making it one of the roughest matchups even in comparison to other dive tanks. However, against point blank burst damage rush tanks like Junker Queen, Maga, and Diva, you'll have a slightly better time relative to your hard counters. In his matchup against Zarya, Doomfist has the ability to sustain through Zarya's damage, but because she can easily peel for her allies with bubble, this ultimately puts you at a disadvantage. Meanwhile, against Ramatra who has lower damage output and Rush Rind who relies on coordinated teamfights, it's much more of a 50-50, but we'll explain more later in the video. Next up is Wrecking Ball. He falls between Winston and Doomfist in terms of diviness, but the biggest difference between Ball and the other two tanks is that you can pressure Rush tanks more effectively thanks to your primary fire. Because because his primary fire is medium range, he can pressure the enemy team more consistently and enables his allies to play more freely as well. In this manner, Ball can contest Winston to a degree and puts him at a slight advantage. Additionally, his rush and poke are surprisingly decent and because of his exceptional mobility can survive against rush style tanks in 1v1 situations. So against Roadhog, Maga, Orisa, Diva, and Ramatra, you have the ability to pressure down and sustain fights, making your chances much better against your counter heroes in comparison into what Winston or Doomfist can do. Meanwhile, if the enemies have a standard full rush composition or has an overwhelming amount of sustainability, things get much more difficult. So playing against tanks with stronger close range damage and sustainability like Junker Queen and Zarya can really ruin your day. And against Reinhardt, there's also a more interesting dynamic. If the Reinhardt's team composition is a strict rush and is on a rush map, the enemy team's sustain becomes much higher than Ball's ability to display.
displace and disrupt the enemies, making the matchup extremely disadvantageous. But like in many competitive matches, if Reinhardt is running more of a dispersed dive style rather than a unified rush, Ball's disruption is able to get much more value, turning the tables in your favor. So depending on the playstyles incorporated by the tanks, the counters can also vary. But before we move on to the rush style tanks, let me elaborate on Dive Rein. Reinhardt, despite being a poster hero of rush compositions, is often utilized in a more similar fashion to Ball, Doomfist, and Winston. Rhine Rush is more demanding in terms of coordination and ally composition, so in many competitive games, we see more players taking advantage of a dive style engagement where you aggressively utilize charge to close the gap on a target. That's one of the reasons why the community data indicates vulnerability against other tanks like we saw with Ball, Doom, and Winston. But a key difference is that against Junker Queen, you have a stronger frontline presence, meaning it's easier to take control of space and a similar strategy can be employed against Hawk. Dive Rhine isn't the most optimal playstyle in terms of the tank matchup, and I'd honestly recommend playing one of the other tanks if you really wanted to dive. With that out of the way, let's get into Rush, the most complex group in the Rock Paper Scissors system. First up is Zarya. She's one of the core heroes of Rush tanks and also shows an aptitude for Anchor. Of course, depending on whether you have low or high energy, Zarya's playability against other tanks can vary. In a high energy state, she's one of the best Rush heroes out there, but in a low energy state, it's extremely difficult to beat any hero for that matter, which can be a huge weakness for the hero. This is why against Winston and Dive style Rhines, she lacks in value. But on the assumption that Zarya is able to build a significant amount of charge amongst the Rush tanks, she can be the strongest hero in terms of raw output, and thus is the only Rush hero with an advantage against anchor tanks like Orisa and D.Va. In this state, as long as the map isn't designed for long sightlines, Zarya can even put up a decent fight against Sigma, who in theory has the upper hand due to poke beats rush logic. One key flaw of Zarya is her small health pool, which in turn results in a lower sustainability. The difference in health makes her weaker against other close range tanks in the rush category. She can be bursted down by tanks like Ramatra and Maga, and the reworked Hog also serves as a challenge. This also makes her more vulnerable to being split off from your backline by heroes like Winston and Ryan. However, in the lower ranks, most fights occur as a head to head battle, and there's a lack of discipline when it comes to not charging her bubbles, making the hero efficient when pressuring down the front line. Furthermore, the lack of health and sustain is often mitigated by the fact that both teams have non-synergistic compositions, and the lack of wins and mastery in these ranks also acts as a plus. With Zarya, it's also possible to use an anchor playstyle. This playstyle often gives you the ability to shut down an engaging Orisa or Junker Queen, but this also means that Zarya struggles to break through a queen who's hiding over cover. Otherwise, she's incompatible with poke, but for dive, you can utilize her bubble to enable allies that are engaging like Reaper or Genji. Now for Junker Queen, Anchor and Poke is off limits, but she can dismantle space control with a rush or an anti-dive playstyle. In the case of anti-dive, you can either play reactively to punish the dive or take the approach of melting the dive backline. The complicated dynamic is with rush. Compared with other rush tanks, Junker Queen has the lowest tanking ability but excels at challenging enemy spaces by boosting your allies with shout. Because of this AoE buff characteristic, her effectiveness can vary depending on the ally composition, which makes the matchup against Ramatra, Roadhog, and Reinhardt fairly neutral. However, against Orisa and Zarya, you're at a very clear disadvantage. Zarya's bubble and honestly, all of Orisa's abilities can shut down Queen fairly easily, even with a synergistic team comp. As such, in comp games, Junker Queen is arguably more effective with an anti-dive playstyle. But the most complex matchup for Queen is the Sigma and Ryan. The map ally and enemy compositions make a large impact in the matchup. At its core, it's a question of is a backline easy to melt? If the Ryan's backline is Sim, Bastion, and Baptiste, who have high damage and survivability, it can be a start to a very rough game. Against Sigma, the question is whether you can quickly close the distance or not. On long sightline maps like Circuit Royal and against the full poke composition, Sigma is highly favorable, and in reverse, on enclosed maps like Lijiang Tower, or if the Sigma's team comp is meh. Junker Queen is able to take control of the game. It's difficult to simply say that the matchup is a 50-50 because results can differ heavily on map and situation. Next is Ramatra. Though he isn't very good at peeling for his allies, he's able to take significantly more aggro in the frontline than any other tank, thanks to his block ability. Whether it's Anchor, Poke, or Rush, the playstyles are all supported through his kit. In Nemesis form, shields can't stop your punches, and in Omnic form, you have quite a bit of poke damage available to you. While he isn't 
isn't able to dive directly, he has a clear way of punishing dives, making him a jack of all trades. These characteristics make it incredibly difficult to balance Ramatra, and the state of each patch seems to have an impact on who comes out on top for the neutral matchups. Due to his versatility, we see Ramatra being experimented with a lot in tournaments. In respect to Rock Paper Scissors, he doesn't exactly fall under the standard archetypes. With the Rush Beats dive logic, he's generally good against Doomfist and Ball, though I would argue that because Ball's mobility is so high, he can easily avoid Ramatra to begin with. Against other Rush heroes like Zarya, Rhine, and Junker Queen, Ramatra can effectively hold his ground. Given his current state in the meta though, he's still great purely in respect to the tank fight, just not necessarily in the context of the entire team fight with all 10 players. He's just far too vulnerable to CC abilities and as a result is vulnerable to Orisa and Rodog as well. Now for D.Va, she dominates the standard dive tanks, making her a great pick for anti-dive. So when pro players pull out the D.Va, it's usually for this exact purpose. Meanwhile, against strong 1v1 rush tanks like Zarya, Sigma, Junker Queen, and Ramatra, she doesn't have as much success. This can also be applied to a standard Rhine rush, but since coordinated rushes are uncommon in ranked, it's not something to be too worried about. With respect to Roadhog, though he can be classified as a brawl type rush tank, D.Va has the means to mitigate this with the anchor playstyle, with a focus on peeling for your allies. Otherwise, we also have the dive style assassination diva. When the enemy is playing rush or poke style tank, the strategy here is to avoid brawling the enemy tank directly and focus primarily on the enemy backline. Though this would normally be an unfavorable matchup, with good enough mechanics, you have the potential to turn the tides. Diva has a very well-defined role of an anti-dive in the rock, paper, scissors ecosystem, but her weakness to rush is also a distinct limitation. Let's take a look at Orisa. She's a hero optimized for countering other tanks, but she's terrible at supporting her allies. Orisa is usually played to counter a specific playstyle. As you can see with the pro player votes at the top right, we can see two votes for Orisa as a counter to Queen, four votes against Ramatra, and three against Doomfist. However, she's limited by the fact that she doesn't have a clear synergistic composition. Despite being great against other tanks, her utilization from a macro strategy perspective is pretty limiting. She's more of an outlier in the rock paper scissors ecosystem. Though she still has counters available like Zarya and D.Va. D.Va serves a very similar role to Orisa but has significantly more mobility, putting Orisa at a slight disadvantage. As long as Zarya is able to fill her energy up, she can dominate Orisa from a close range, especially when Zarya only chooses to focus you down. You honestly have no playstyle options to mitigate this, making Zarya a hard counter to Orisa. Next is Sigma. He has a very distinct poke playstyle and because of his high survivability is even able to provide rush capabilities. However, there's zero dive potential, and when Sigma rush clashes with other rush tanks, he may need a helping hand. So in most maps and situations, Sigma's primary targets are going to be the squishies rather than the enemy tank, which is what set him apart for success in the recent metas. Additionally, thanks to his long range, on poke maps, he's the most dominant tank. Currently, there's just no other tank for poke comps like Sigma. It's just not even a competition. Against Sigma on a poke map with a full poke composition, you need the most perfectly executed rush, which is extremely difficult to pull off in rank. However, in most maps and on average compositions that force you to play rush type Sigma, he can struggle against Zarya and Orisa, who are great at brawling you out through your slow fire rate. Furthermore, it can be difficult to stop dives from Ball, Doomfist, and Winston. But against space-oriented brawl tanks like Hog, Rhine, Queen, and D.Va, it can be much more of a skill matchup. And finally, for the reworked Roadhog, is his exceptional ability to anchor down using Hook and Pigpen. He's very powerful against Ball, Winston, and Dive style Rhine, as well as Doomfist. He has an aptitude for Rush, but due to his limited range, can struggle against ranged tanks like Sigma and Anchor style Divas that keep you out of your effective range. In the case of Orisa, her CC and her range advantage previously made the matchup more difficult, but now with the new breather, your chances aren't as bad as before. Other Rush tanks have a pretty similar effective range, and the high kill potential of your hook results in a fairly even matchup. And of course, he's not going to be very good for dive or poke. Then what about Maga? This one is purely speculation, so please take it with a pinch of salt, but from a playstyle perspective, he seems to have an aptitude for rush and dive. It's really a question of can you proc your passive, but ultimately it's a question of whether you can proc your passive. He's a bit weaker against Junker Queen, Diva, Sigma, and for the rest of the rush heroes, it's pretty neutral. In the rush category, he shows similarities with tanks like Zarya and Ramatra, but looks to have the higher damage output, making him potentially better against the two heroes. With the high amount of close range burst, massive health pool, and hard mobility 
ability shutdown ultimate, Manga also has a bit of an anti-dive quality. But in reality, we'll have to wait and see how things play out. Wow, this was ridiculously long, but I think we did a pretty good job at explaining the tank ecosystem based off of the past year of Overwatch 2. But like always, this is all stats and numbers, just theory in an isolated environment. Which means in reality, there's always so many more variables to consider, like maps. Maps like Li Jiang Tower is so favorable to rush that even your average Joe Reinhardt can pull off an effective rush composition with his team. But we'll save the maps topic for another video. Ultimately, the key consideration in the tank rock paper scissors is the playstyle incorporated as well as whether the direct matchup is truly taking place. Simply put, Zarya has to force the engagement with the D.Va in order to reap the benefits of being the counter. If the D.Va is constantly escaping and avoiding the direct fight in the first place, playing rock paper scissors is kind of meaningless. Similarly, there's also some situations where the tank advantage is only in effect when you're focusing more on the squishies rather than the enemy tank, like in the case of Sigma or Ramatra. Okay, I'm actually done now. As much as it took ages to compile and verbalize all of this information, I really hope this helped everyone out. If we keep breaking down aspects of Overwatch one by one, it's honestly not as complicated as we often make it out to be. I mean, heck, in Overwatch 1 with two tanks, oh, don't even get me started. I don't even want to talk about the ridiculous amount of complexity there. Anyways, this was Crow. It's currently 4am. Thanks for watching, and I'll be back again next time.